Hi, I'm Claire Redaway, and this is a story called The Long Black Coat. I was in the college common room, trying to look poised while sitting in an orange bean bag, not easy, and playing Drink Along a Dallas. Now, Drink Along a Dallas is a fine drinking game based on the simple principle that you can only drink when a character on the screen drinks. It is particularly satisfactory when you catch an episode with, which focuses on Suella. <laughs> and her alcoholism. <laughs> Unfortunately, during this particular episode, Suella was enduring one of her many unsuccessful bouts of rehab. <laughs> On the plus side, the Ewings were having a party at their ranch Southwark. The main characters, Suella accepted, had developed a habit of lifting a glass to their lips and then putting it down again the mountain <laughs> Preoccupied as they were with discussing JR's latest shafting of Cliff or a slight worrying displacement of Bobby's hair. <laughs> Frustration led to our drinking gang shouting, Perm, drink, perm, drink, perm, drink, and rah! When the beautiful Pamela Ewing let a drop slide between her exquisite lips and we could all let down our shandies. <laughs> I was a fresher at a northern university. It was 1984. I was a home county's convent girl and had never been away from home. I was loving it. I was a part of a strange, hairy gang of enormous men boys who were bursting out of their jeans and fruits of the moon sweatshirts. I could like nothing better than to wrestle in mud and grunt. <laughs> As you can imagine, their conversation was straightforward. One of the men boys, James, had taken something of a shine to me. He was not well versed in the arts of seduction, our James. When he saw Pam Ewing take her sip, he roared and swigged down a whole pint of beer to the raucous cheers of the other men boys. Then he turned to me in triumph and burped. Do <laughs> what I can do. Look on his face. I just wasn't sure. <laughs> leaning on a window, all in black, silver studs, pointed shoes, a long coat. What is it about long black coats that says, I think do the moon for <laughs> Hair slipped back under a hat, face very pale, eyes sooty. Was that makeup he was wearing? He stared at me and raised one eyebrow. Possibly because of the burp, it really was very loud. <laughs> he took his glass and drank down, not beer, but something pale red and bubbly. That looked a bit like Ribena, but couldn't have been because Ribena is not and never has been cool. He drank, but no one of Dallas was drinking. The wave was impossibly rebellious. He <laughs> put down his glass and jerked his head. I struggled out of the beanbag. Would you like to hear something? The wave said. I would. So I followed him out of the common room into the gardens of the college to a large oak tree. It was dark and the stars and the moon were silver bright. Listen, he said. Nightingales, really loud actually, twittering in a show offy way with their tunes and their trills. Liquid delight. I thought he'd kiss me, but he didn't. Instead, we went back to his room and sat on his bed and listened to his music and we talked and talked. How unfair it was Nelson Mandela was still in prison. How the Smiths were good, but too much more as he could make you feel, well, depressed. <laughs> How unflattering, but really politically important, uh, that Frankie says relaxed t-shirts were. Would they look better with a belt? <laughs> How much more real the north of England seemed to both our hometowns in the south. How neither of us had done well in geography and level, because the questions have been completely different to other years. <laughs> <laughs> Toast, just that Cheddar was okay, how we really like to go and support the miners, but it was so hard to find out where the buses went. <laughs> <laughs> From then on, Zander, his name's Alex, but he'd taken to Zander when he got to university, and I were an item. We did everything together. We took long walks along the river, discussed Dylan Thomas and Sylvia Platt. We made sculptures out of twigs which we hung from branches. <laughs> we formed our names out of moss and left them on grey stone walls, ephemeral, 
transcendental. <laughs> we read ghost stories to each other at three in the morning as we sip port and lemon. We scoured jungle sales and junk shops to create our own style, which we said was a postmodern expressionist anti-military statement, <laughs> of which my father described. I went home for a weekend. Tell me what bloody scrubby students were in space. <laughs> we even had sex. It was gentle and sweet and respectful. Not that rumbustious kind of sex my friend Tess had with James. It turned out I hadn't broken James this hard. I saw her reeling out of his room one morning and I could hear him doing a chuddery roar of triumph around the door. I asked her if he burped on orgasm. I knew that Xander loved me when he made me a mixtape. It was full of female singers, which chanteurs, he called them. Singing poignant, smoky songs about bedsits in Hull or perfidious men. All of them had thwarted, anguished love at their heart, abandoned women, sorrow. No Duran Duran or Thriller for Xander, or me. I missed him some fingerless gloves. I think it sent the same message. <laughs> <laughs> Xander and I knew, thought, we were the ultimate in cool. But we weren't above going to a party in a sneery sort of way. We even went to the spring ball. We both wore black tie and lipstick. So daring. <laughs> we danced all night to tainted love and careless whisper, and in the morning we stumbled out into the city and the co-op, desperate for food to stave off hangovers. Extravagantly, wildly, we bought tins and tins of baked beans. <laughs> At the door, a miner's wife was shaking a bucket. Money for the miners, it said. Zander so took our tins and dumped them in the bucket, then grabbed the woman and kissed her. She wiped the lipstick. <laughs> And the look of content she gave us so it would be more than any baked bean would. It's not long after that ball that we went to London for the weekend. It was six hours on a coach, and playing knots and crosses made me feel sick. So I fell asleep on Sandra's shoulder, breathing in mothballs, lavender, and boy skin. We arrived at King's Cross, walking distance from Zander's brother's flat in the Pentonville Road, where we were dossing before setting our plan in motion. Zander had heard about this club called Heaven. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had never seen the light. I thought Zander and I were cool. The covers are heaven. My mouth hit my knees. Men, hundreds of men, beautiful men, dressed in velvet and fur, in leather. <coughs> What's a leather? <laughs> with long spikes and swirls. It works a lot on their heads. Made up like Marie Antoinette, like Adam Ant, like. Alexander, who had slammed on the snap before going out. Lights were strobing, the music was throbbing, I was dancing and dancing, music driving through me, everyone was so thrilling. I was being thrown from side to side, I didn't think I'd ever had such fun as a party in my life. But I couldn't find Sander. Probably he was there. Then he'd gone. I was dancing with Sander's brother and his friends, and then they weren't there either, and suddenly it wasn't quite such fun, and so I went back to the flat in Pentonville Road, only I couldn't get in. I fell asleep on the doorstep, and I only woke up when Zander shook my shoulder. I was frozen. It was eight in the morning. He bought us bacon butties. He was hyperactive. Couldn't stop talking about heaven, how fantastic it was, the music, the dancing. It was as though, well, what I thought is maybe he'd found some new drug. I was proud I didn't attach any judgment to the idea. So, hey, my boyfriend takes drugs. But that wasn't what Sandra had been experimenting with that night. Things changed after London. Sandra and I were still an item. We still stayed up all night talking, and we went for long, meandering walks, hand in hand. The sex stopped, though. And a distance formed between us. I started seeing some other friends. Tess and I joined the film club and watched the back-to-back -back Tennessee Williams marathon. <laughs> I auditioned for a summer play, but a small, but significant part. <laughs> <laughs> I was busy, so was Sandra, and soon enough, six weeks a term passed without me seeing him. Then we bumped into each other in the street. He suggested a coffee. When we sat down, I thought he looked nervous. His hands were shaking, and I saw a purple blemish on one, like a bird. He saw me looking and pulled his shirt down over his knuckles, covering it. Are you all right? I said. 
he's HIV positive, of course. I was the first person he told. And God help me, as that damn iceberg's eyes ran through my veins, my first words to the boy I loved were, have you given it to me? He didn't come back to university after the summer. I wrote to him long, rambling letters written in different coloured ink with poetry and leaves I thought he'd like stuck onto the page with maps of where they'd come from. I filled one envelope with twigs I'd tied into a sculpture and I with moss. I showed the collection bucket at the Student Union for the Terence Higgins Trust. I organised a fundraising event. I wrote an article for the student newspaper about prejudice. I even went on a march. But I never visited him. Not once. When he died, his parents informed the university and a bunch of us went to the funeral, including James the Burman. Xander had asked the plumed black horses to pull a carriage carrying his coffin. He did so love that. You could see the flamboyance waiting with his parents, but they went along with it. His mother hugged me and introduced me to everyone as Darling Alex's girlfriend. He talked about you all the time, she said never questioning why I hadn't been to see him as he was dying. Pneumonia, his father boomed to anyone who'd listen. Cross it hiding on the moors of this fine filly, I shouldn't wonder. And his eyes pleaded with me. I should have shouted the truth out, but Sander died of pleasure of discovering himself. But that shouldn't be shameful, and it certainly shouldn't be fatal. But I didn't. I was complicit. Perhaps James was the most honest of us, weeping extravagantly at Zander's graveside. None of us had ever seen a coffin lowered into the ground before, and it struck us forcibly. James said, oh, I should be more careful, stupid bugger. In his will, Zander left me his poetry books and some of his records, his collection of torch singers. He left me with guilt and shame, an urge to be braver, truer to myself, more honest, and he left me his coat. I still wear it sometimes. It's strange to hear the nightingales. Oh.